Welcome to Hiraith, the home of modern Welsh politics. 2022 has seen the world move into a major period of turmoil and change affecting global economies. In Britain, the after effects of Brexit continue. A leadership contest for a new Prime Minister is underway and the Labour Party is battling to develop policies to make the most of this conservative impasse. At the same time, the fragile nature of the union has never been more apparent. Joining us to talk through this and more is Professor Danny Blanchfell, CBE, Professor of Economics at Dartmouth College, New Hampshire, a Professor at the University of Glasgow and former member of the Bank of England's Monetary Policy Committee. He is also an alumni of Cardiff's Cantonian High School, the University of Wales, and is an honorary fellow of Cardiff University. Hello, Danny. Hi, nice to talk to you. Danny, welcome. It really is a privilege to have you here today. I, I'm a big fan, but I'll try not to embarrass you too much. Before we look at some of those big ticket items Matt mentioned, um, we've got to take the Welsh approach to here. And uh, you've got some Welsh links. You know Cardiff very well. A Cantonian high school old boy. Is that all right? Yeah, actually, I go way back. In fact, my great-grandparents lived in Swansea. And when I was a kid, every summer we'd spend there and, and, on, and on the Gower. And then uh, in 1966, my parents moved from Brighton to Cardiff and I went to, it was actually Canton High School for Boys when I first went there. And then it became Cantonian High School. Um, and I became a fan of Welsh rugby at a time when Gareth Edwards and Barry John and uh, JPR Williams and all of those guys were playing. So Cardiff, I used to watch Cardiff all the time in the Welsh rugby team. And then I came back eventually in the mid, mid to late seventies to do a, a master's degree, start a PhD, and then move on. And in fact, for one year, I actually was a temporary lecturer at University College Cardiff for, for a year when uh, someone, someone uh, John Bridge, was away. So I've had connections to Cardiff for years, and I have great sympathy with the place. That, that's fantastic to hear. It is really nice to have such a history in the, in the city and the country. And we'll try and draw on that a little bit later. But... While I'm tempted to pursue that Welsh rugby interest you had there, you know, I, I think we very much got you in today to, to, to look at, you know, your, your expertise. You know, we're going to look at the global economy first, just very much a high level. Can you give us a, a quick overview of where you see the global economy at the moment? In, in, a, in a sense, my background training and experience has actually been very international. Um, I lived in, the, obviously, in the UK and I left in 1989 to go to the US and I've basically studied global economies and I've studied unemployment and I've studied recessions. Uh, and I actually teach a class at Dartmouth called pandemics and financial crises. So I've actually worried about pandemics. I've worried about the great crash. I've worried about the great recession. Uh, and I think the problem in many senses is that this is really a one-off. The global economy has been hit by a, well, a shock in, in 2008, a huge financial crisis shock that looks to have, uh, the, its effects look to be continuing now. I mean, as a labor economist, everything changed from 2008. For example, the unemployment rate used to tell us a lot about what's gone in the labor market. It doesn't tell us that anymore. Um, and so we're in a situation where the only analogy I can give you is you look back in, in, in 1914, 1918, we had a war followed by a pandemic, followed by a crash. And what we had since 2018 was a crash, followed by a pandemic, followed by a war. So we have some degree of precedent. But I think that the difficulty right now is that most commentators are talking as if they have a degree of certainty about how this world works. And we really don't. This is really unprecedented times. So coming out of COVID, coming out of the lockdown was a major shock. People thought that inflation was going to be transitory, including me. And in a way, that turned out to be a mistake because we didn't forecast the fact that Russia was going to invade Ukraine and we were going to be confronted by a major war. I think the best story that I can give you is that the world is a highly uncertain place. And I think I have pretty good understanding of what's going on, but I really don't know. And I think for listeners of the podcast, the right thing to say to you is most of the time, and you hear people talking with great certainty about what's coming, they're just making it up. They have absolutely no idea. And I've introduced a, a, a phrase which will get people going. It doesn't really need much explanation. It's called guessonomics. 
there's not a department, there's a department of economics in most universities, but there probably should be departments of guessonomics right now, and anybody can participate. All you have to do is make it up as you go along and say nonsense. So I think that's probably where we are. Very hard to forecast. And if you listen to the election in the UK now, you're hearing, hearing two politicians talk about stuff and basically just making it up. They really don't know what's coming. We don't know what's going to happen to, to COVID. We don't know what's going to happen to Omicron. We've not really got a clue what's going to happen in the Ukraine war. So it's just be mindful that you don't know what's coming. Uh, and politicians should be mindful of that. And so should listeners to this podcast. These are unprecedented times. And just think, 18 months ago, would we have known what had happened to the virus? Three months ago, did we know that there was going to be a second burst? So the answer is highly uncertain times and be careful of people saying they have a clue because they don't. That will be very welcoming, I'm sure, to uh, Welsh Government Minister Lee Waters, who was very much criticised a few years ago by saying, we don't know what we're doing with the economy. Well, I mean, can I just respond? I mean, the way to think of it is there, there are probably a set of scenarios you know, that Omicron goes away, that the war finishes, that commodity prices suddenly decline and people start to feel confident. A whole series of possible scenarios. And the Welsh minister should probably say in each of these scenarios, there's certain things that we can do. But we have absolutely no clue which of them is coming. And so I think you just have to be mindful of that and don't listen to it. I mean, th think of the people who told you about what was going to happen to COVID. Uh, and all these epidemiologists who basically were clueless. You know, that's the global economy. And I actually spent some of the weekend looking at the current housing crisis in China. And there's some worrying stuff around there if you, if you look a little deeper. But if we can look at the UK, you know, it's one of the main global economies. And we're suffering similar kind of inflation, what we see around the world. But we're dealing with one of those, uh, well, some people would say, uh, shooting ourselves in the foot with the after effects of Brexit. You know, how, do you, how do you think the UK economy is looking currently? Have we got a winter of discontent ahead? <laughs> well, the, I, I was reading something earlier this morning, which I thought was pretty interesting, which is apparently a study has just been done to say that not a single country in the world has got inflation under 2%. So this is a global inflation shock. And what we're seeing around the world are central banks making this all much worse because they seem to think we're in 1975 when we clearly are not. And so what we're seeing in the UK is a repeat in many ways of what happened in 2007 and 2008, where policymakers don't know what they're doing, pretend that they do, uh, and have made things much worse. Uh, the story that I would take for the UK and elsewhere is that we can predict recessions pretty well now. And in fact, in 2008, I think I gave a speech in Cardiff, in fact, about it. And I gave a speech in Edinburgh in April 2008. And it was pretty clear then that you could forecast what was coming based upon what people's views were. I call it the economics of walking about. You talk to the people of Wales and you ask them, what do you think is going on? And it turned out by April 2008, they basically said, we think the recession's coming. And collapsing consumer confidence is a really big deal. So what we've seen in the UK, just as we saw in 2008, was that consumer confidence has collapsed. And so if that happens, basically what you'll see, if consumers are, are not confident about what's coming, what do they do? They stop spending. That means retail sales fall. That means GDP falls. That means the economy slows. Firms lay off people. The probability is, I think, very likely UK's been in recession since the start of 2020. That, that looks to me to be probable, and particularly um, because of um, retail sales and bad data. People forget that lots of data we saw in, in 2008, and I was, I was someone who was really kept saying we were going to recession. And I was taken aback in July 2008 when we got um, the first estimate of what would happen to our output in the second quarter. And it was plus 0.2. And I kept saying, oh, it's going to be minus. Well, anyway, so we get into revisions at turning points like recessions. Turns out that actually today we know the answer was minus 0.6. So GDP output for the economy fell by 0.6, even though at the first moment we thought it had risen. So I think we are very clearly seeing recession. I think it's quite clear that Germany and France and Italy and Sweden and the rest of the European Union are actually in recession as well. So the UK can't duck that. And so what we're going to see will be 
bad things. I don't, we can talk about how bad they'll be. But essentially what we have is the Bank of England made matters much worse. They've, they've said that we need to raise rates. Well, why would you raise rates in a period where there's a recession? And so what we're seeing is suddenly the mood music has started to turn. And yes, maybe at the next meeting they're going to raise rates, but my bet is that they're going to be cutting rates, presumably by the end of this year, as the economy moves into recession, a recession that they've caused. And so group think at the Bank of England in 2008, group think at the Bank of England again, they appear to be clueless. And the question is, if they're all thinking the same, all nine of them are thinking the same, and they're all wrong. So why do you need a committee of nine in group think who all think the same and have got it wrong? You have all these people. What's interesting is that all, every member of the MPC, as far as I can tell, has actually lived in London. David Miles was, was a Welshman, so there is that too. But basically, not a single person has been living in Wales. No one's represented Welsh interests. Why wouldn't you have, let's say, a representative of, of Wales on the committee who might be able to say what's happened in Wales? And you could argue the same for Scotland, and you could argue the same for, for Northern Ireland and elsewhere. And the probability is that the representative from Wales would say the last thing we need to see are interest rate rises that are going to cause the housing market to crash. And then back to your very good point, Kerry, the other story is that China is slowing. And we've got very, very weak data for China. So you're the Monetary Policy Committee, and you say the big problem is inflation. Well, actually, you said that in 2008. That turned out not to be true. And so we're in a very bad situation. And then we have um, two politicians, um, Sunak and Trust, arguing about tax cuts and presumably spending declines so that they can make for the economy of Wales worse. So we're now in a major crisis where the politicians appear to be in Gaga land. Let's, let's build on that then, uh, Danny, with the, the Conservative leadership contest. Obviously, Labour are claiming that between them, the Conservative uh, prospective candidates for Prime Minister promised something like £330 billion of uncosted tax cuts. But have you had any more sort of deeper thoughts on the economics of, of the two remaining candidates and, and what that would mean for the UK economy if either of them were to win? Well, they're both fighting hard for the, for the, for the right wing of the Tory party, both talking about unfunded tax cuts. But I do worry a lot, and I have a column this week in the Evening Standard. I mean, at least you would say as an economist that, that Sunak is a known, a known event. The worry for me is that trust has actually come out with things which just look to be completely idiotic. I mean, the idea that suddenly you're going to tell the Bank of England you can't, you, you've got to change its remit, you can't allow it to be independent. The great benefit of the Bank of England, I've been critical. In 1989, um, Bulls and Brown declared the Bank of England was independent, and that lowered the borrowing cost to the country because it had a degree of credibility. And so then you start to say, well, following, following the recommendation of Patrick Minford, that interest rates should go to 7%, we should probably go back and look at the last time he made a recommendation of that kind. What happened to unemployment for the people in Wales? The answer was, um, in 1979, Thatcher came in and the unemployment rate was 5.3%. It didn't get back to 5.3% for 20 years. And in fact, from 1981 to 1987, it averaged in double figures and we got to a peak of 11.9%. So that looks like a pretty disastrous thing to do. Failed last time. The recommendation of Minford that Brexit would, would raise GDP growth, we now know that it's certainly declined it by 4% or so, probably more. My concern is that if trust was to get into office and do some of these things, the, 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 what would happen would be the, the markets would respond, the bond market would respond, the stock market would respond, and just like with Dennis Healy, who had to dash back from the airport, the exchange rate would respond. And I would have thought if there's prospect that Liz Truss is going to get in, we're going to see a lot of shorting of the pound because these look like amateur hour. And you can say things to get elected, but you'd better not do things because the bond markets will get you. And I quote the famous quote by James Carville, but President Clinton's advisor said, I thought that I wanted to come back in the next life as the Pope or the president or a, a fantastic hitter in baseball. And what I've decided is I should come back as the bond markets because they can intimidate everybody. So I think that, you know, I think in a way, the, the markets prevent people like trust doing idiotic things. But I'm certainly, I certainly don't, don't, I, I don't think that the markets think that Sunak is going to crash the markets. 
but trust might well do that. So that looks a worry, but it certainly doesn't appear that you need major unfunded tax cuts right now, and along with them cuts in spending that would basically make, I always talk about, you know, the, the person not walking down Main Street. How is any of the things that we've talked about likely to help the average Welsh person walking down the Main Street going to, buy, going to the shops? And the answer is it looks, all of it looks to be disastrous. All of it looks to raise unemployment. I see no basis on any of these policies that this will improve the world. I talk a lot about the well-being of the, the woman on the Mile End Road omnibus. Why I do that and not talk about Colchester Avenue or something in Cardiff is that the Mile End Road starts a mile from Allgate. Starts, so Allgate is the centre of the city of London. The question is, does this policy help the ordinary person? It can be, as I say, the person in Swansea or Merthyr Tidville or Bangor or any place. But the issue is, do these policies help the ordinary person? And as far as I can tell, what's likely to come from it is unemployment is going to rise dramatically because of these failed policies. As a, as a graduate of Queen Mary and a former uh, resident of the Mile End Road, I have no criticism of that. My analogy. daughter was born at the, at the, um, at the London Hospital in, in Whitechapel. She's a true cockney. But yeah, I went to <laughs> Queen Mary and Queen oh. Mary sits on the Mile End Road. There's the Whitechapel Road and the Mile End Road. But the way to think of it is, it's a, it starts from 1100, but it's a mile from Aldgate. And you think two different worlds, right? You know what the Mile End Road's yeah. like, you know what Whitechapel's like. So the issue you have to ask yourself and the people of Wales should ask is, does this help bankers? Does this help hedge funds? And does it, ha does it help David in Merthyr Tidville? That's what we should ask. And as far as I can tell, it hurts. Unemployment hurts more than inflation does. The MPC has missed it all, done it again, and it's going to create a giant recession. And the worry is that it'll be worse than it was in 2008, because at least in 2008, eventually I could get my colleagues to cut interest rates from 5% to a half a percent. Today, interest rates can't be cut by more than about, what, 1.2%? So now, what's the response going to be? Nothing. They've created a hole for themselves that people are not going to be able to dig themselves out of, and politically, it looks a disaster. So that's where we are. So, Danny, you, you mentioned Patrick Minford. Obviously, for those who don't know, Patrick Minford, former you know, economic advisor to Thatcher. Some of these, both the, the two remaining Conservative candidates for Prime Minister, are trying to make themselves out to be the heir to Thatcher. Would you be able to sort of explain for our listeners how the economies are different from that period to now and, and, and why Thatcher was able to react the way she was economically and why that may be more tricky now? I probably could say it in a pretty simple way, I think. And I remember I, I graduated in 1973. I went and trained as a teacher of economics. And in the 70s, I taught... I taught economics. I taught it in schools and colleges, and then eventually I went to university. But I, was, I studied unemployment in those years. So let's just look back at what happened. In 1968, the, there were Paris riots, which scared the world. And for a decade, union membership and union power around the world rose strongly by 3 million or so in the UK. And so what we saw in the 70s, when I was a student, the lights would go out. And we'd have to go to the pub because the, there was a strike of electricity workers and there was rubbish in the street. There was much industrial discontent. And so worker power was very large. Workers were able to respond to these inflation shocks by really large pay increases. In America, they had things called COLA clauses. So you'd negotiate that. You had a pay deal with me, 5% pay deal, and you'd have on it a cost of living adjustment. And you'd say, for each 1% inflation is above, let's say, 5 I'm going to get a 1% more. So if you inflate, you got a 5% settlement and inflation was 15, you got another 10% added to your paycheck. So that was a big deal. And Volcker and other people came in and said, you've really got to deal with that. You've got to raise interest rates. So the first thing is that's just not true anymore. Union membership has been in decline for decades. And we have a global economy. The chances of the chances, try this one, and I'm a Cardiff City supporter, the chances of that happening are about as high as Cardiff City winning the Premier League in two years' time and winning the FA Cup in both years, much as I would like to see it. Um, that ain't, or Swansea or, you know, Wrexham or Newport County, whatever, who I used to go and watch too. But I think the answer is that, you know, the world has changed, but the policy prescriptions that Minford uh, has proposed, uh, I mean, his, his record is he's been the worst economic forecaster in the country, and every single thing he's ever said turned out to be wrong. And so this would be disastrous. If they followed this policy, I can tell you, unemployment in Wales would be in double digits within two years.
That's, that would be my prediction if you listen to a word this person said. In union relations uh, and sort of industrial relations anyway in the UK are at, at a weird sort of right. moment, We're, whereas we are now looking very likely like we're going to have a summer of strike action. Well, uh, the, of course, and what's happened, let's just think this through, the, the British people have to decide what level of services they require. So if inflation is running at 9.4% and you're offering 2% as a pay increase, well, a number of things happen. The reason you have 100,000 vacancies and poor quality service in the NHS is you haven't invested in it and you haven't paid enough money, so people quit. They've gone back, they've, they've gone abroad, they've gone to the private sector, they've done other things. So that's the first thing, and workers are trying to protect their pay. And I think the, um, the discussion about trains and the, and the union uh, leader of RMT has had it right. And the way he said it is this, and I think it's right. Over the last decade or so, firms have had the ability to pay workers more, and they chose not to. They chose that they didn't want to do that. And what they did was they paid the profit, they had the ability with the earning power of the firms, think of the railway companies. And what they did was they paid high dividends to their shareholders, right? And then they paid massive pay increases to their CEOs, and they decided not to pay the workers. So then he says, and probably rightly, okay, well, if there's a 10% pay raise, this doesn't need to increase prices at all. It's just your turn to take the strain. It's you guys have paid it to yourselves and you didn't pay it to the workers. And the workers have said, well, this is ridiculous. We can't carry on like this. If prices are rising by nine and you're offering me three, my real wages are in decline. But you have the ability to pay. You paid it to yourselves and to your shareholders. And the public sector decided that it wanted to lower the quality of services by underpaying public sector workers. And a public sector job is not slavery. It's not slavery. If you, if you say, come and work as a doctor or teachers, come and work as a teacher and we'll pay you 25,000 quid or whatever it is a year. And the teacher says, I can make that work in, in, in McDonald's. And so you pays your money and you takes your choice. And what's happened is that workers have said enough is enough. You guys have had the ability to pay us. You've chosen not to. You've chosen to give big, I mean, the government decided it would give a big pay raise to pensioners, but it wouldn't give it to doctors, wouldn't give it to teachers, wouldn't give it to uh, police. And it's decided that it's going to cut the civil servants by 90,000. But if you do that, you take the consequences of it. And the public has to say, do we want to have this low pay, which generates a collapse in the NHS, a huge rise in, in wait times, you can't get an operation, you can't see a dentist. Well, that's what, these are choices and workers are gonna stand up and say enough. And you're gonna see more and more strikes because workers say we've had enough and or they're gonna quit. And that's why you can't get an operation. You can't get into the emergency room because that's a choice by firms. And it's a choice by the government to underpay workers, allow them to quit. And it's a choice by the government to, to do that and to allow 100,000 vacancies in the NHS are just because you don't pay workers enough and it's not slavery. I think one of the things that a lot of people in the trade union movement in the UK are worried about is just the way that the UK government continue to sort of cut at workers' rights. And with certain reg regulations that have been passed recently by the UK government, they seem to be basically allowing agency workers to fill in Yes, in any yes circumstance. it's done that, but it has to take the consequence. Let me give you a little story. There's a famous paper and I actually said, quoting, who did this, I sent a tweet and I said, I hope you've hired a lawyer because here's the evidence. There's a famous paper written by my old friend who uh, sadly just died, Alan Kruger, who, who it's the most famous paper on this exact work. And he studied what happened at Firestone, the tire company. And the tire company did exactly what Quarting and the government is arguing. It said, we should be allowed to bring in agency workers. So they brought the agency workers in. Well, guess what happened? They make tires. So it turns out there was a huge slew of, of tires bursting. I think 200 people died. Lots of people were injured. And what this study did is it went and said, well, when were the tires made that collapsed? Turns out they were made when the agency workers had been brought in, particularly when they were brought in working with, with normal workers. The papers, I mean, people called them scabs. So what happened was there were enormous lawsuits because the law that they put into place basically killed people. And it destroyed Firestone, closed the company down. And the implication here is if these, I mean, given that this paper exists, so you bring in agency workers onto the trains, then presumably what it does is it lowers the safety level on the trains, raises the probability of accidents, raises the probability that someone's going to be killed. 
and presumably the government's aware of it, and any employer who does this in an accident because they're liable, particularly because famous paper by Alan Kruger warned them. So this looks like, you know, yeah, you want to go and bash the workers, but the people are going to say, well, you know, how, how does this work out? Um, I mean, and the other thing I would always argue is that it turns out that strikes, very often strikes are actually about bad management. They're not about bad workers. Remember, two sides to tango. Managers under, un, underestimate the, the power of the workers and they underestimate. I mean, if you can workers say, well, you're going to do this, but we're not, we're going to go on strike because we think it makes it dangerous, too dangerous for the commuters into Waterloo to ride these trains because they think it's too dangerous, they're likely to die. What, are the, what is the commuter going to say? The commuter is going to say, uh-oh, right? So there is a balance here. You can keep, I mean, in a way, I was told the story, I have a super, I guess he died now, but a Bernese mountain dog, the sweetest, kindest dog you've ever seen. But if you keep poking him in the eye with a sharp stick, you'll bite your arm off. Eventually, you'll bite your arm off. And that's really where we are. You can only beat the workers down for so long. You can't legislate good industrial relations. And the public has to be aware that if you want to have a good service, you're going to need to pay people sensibly. And that's the balance the British public has to work out. If you want to have a good national health service, you're going to have to pay for it. If you're not going to pay, pay for it, then don't complain about the fact that you can't get into the emergency room. You can't get an ambulance. You can't get the dentist. Those are, those are choices by the government to do that. I think... A lot of what you just said there, Danny, and what you explored with Matt on the Conservative candidates for Prime Minister, we should be in a position with the country that Labour are in a really good place to, to make hay while the sun shines, as it were. But I do think you've, be, you've commented, and I think it's fair to say, a little critical of some of the, the Labour policies that they're bringing forward. Have you got any thoughts on what they should be doing? Well, you know, to... I, I did hear this morning that Rachel Reeves said they're not going to private, they're not going to um, nationalise power and rail and so on. So what are you going to do? I mean, let's go back to the... Um, Richard Murphy and I set up a group called the Mile End Road Economists, back to our Mile End Road, the, the woman on the Mile End Road omnibus. And the, in a sense, the question you have to ask yourself is, well, what is Labour going to offer that's different? And it has, it, somehow or other has to offer workers, has to offer the person in Merthyr Tidville, it has to offer them something. It has to say, I'm going to improve public services, I'm going to make it so that your pay is improved, that your standard of living is improved, and that relative to the, to the rich, if you like, that you're going to do better. And my concern is, and, you know, my concern is, what is Labour offering? It's offering Tory light. It's not going to, it says, I'm going to do, I'm not going to redo Brexit. Well, what are you going to do? It's unclear to me that, you know, that there is a, a thought exactly what's going on. So I've been trying to put together a group of economists to try and think about, well, what should Labour do? I don't think it should be Tory light, and it should actually try and think about, and this is probably not controversial. I mean, like, what's a, you know a name of a street in Merthyr Tidville? I'd like to know a name. Come up with a name for somebody. Instead of the Mile End Road, let's have whatever it is, Saucepan Vac Street, right? But let's think about, Labour has to, has to say, think of the 50 seats that went red Labour seats that went to the Tories. They have to, in my view, offer something. And if they say, oh, come on, I'm going to tell you anything about Brexit. So what are you going to do? You're going to have tax cuts. You have spending increases for workers. Well, they haven't said that. So my view would be the Labour Party has got to come up with things that, that will help ordinary people. And I don't think they've done that. And I was an advisor to Corbyn and I quit because I thought there were economic policies they were coming out with were ridiculous. You have to have things that are electorally positive, that people will, will see that help them. Um, and, and in a way, the Labour Party to this point has just ruled things out. We're not going to help with welfare. We're not going to improve the road services. We're not going to change tax. We're not going to affect Brexit. Well, what are you going to do? And my view is that you've got to try and come up with things that, that are going to be uh, have real value and real help to, to the ordinary person in Merthyr Tidville. And at this point, it doesn't seem that they have that. And I've, and I've said to them, I'm perfectly willing to try and think about that and think about something that's credible, but I, I don't think they really quite got the plot yet. And, and maybe other parties do, and that'll provide, provide an opportunity. Let's think for Welsh, Welsh nationalists, for the Scottish nationalists. The Scottish nationalists say, well, the Labour Party's not doing it, the Tory Party's not doing it, let's be independent. And so this may well end up generating you know, more, more, more support for independence, because if the Labour Party doesn't do it and the Tory Party doesn't do it, then we better do it ourselves. And I think that's a great, a great danger. And I'm at the University of Glasgow, and there's going to be a major debate 
obviously they're about Scottish independence. And if the Scots get it, then the Welsh might say they want it. And then the Northern Irish, who are basically independent now. So this, unless you can come up with things that help the ordinary person, what the heck is going on? No one's going to support you. And they'll say, well, you're all the same. And the, and the views of politicians collapse. I think we want, we definitely want to turn to devolution and uh, what's going on as part of the union a little later. Um, you, you did take out our uh, Rachel Reeves comment from this morning, so that, uh, thanks for picking that one up. But it's glad to know that you're still looking at uh, everything oh, that's yeah, going I on. Oh everything. I watch everything. With your experience and looking around the world, you know, what would you say Keir Starmer should put in in his next manifesto? I, I veer towards the green side of politics, Danny, and have stood for the Green Party in Wales on a number of occasions, and we're very much pushing UBI four day week you know, things which I think are quite radical for the 21st century. Is, is there anything you've seen around the world you think Labour should well, be looking at? Well, I mean, I think, you know, in a way, I have a couple of thoughts. In, in, a, in a way, perhaps the Labour Party should be working quietly away and try to come up with things that will be helpful. A good analogy is Bulls and Brown in 1989. They never announced it, it wasn't part of the policy, but they had worked away very carefully and announced very quickly when they came into office that they would make the Bank of England independent, which turned out to be a really smart thing to do. So the first thing I think you should be doing is carefully considering and trying to get together a group of people who are going to evaluate a set of policies. Now, probably, probably Starmer is right. Right, If you come up with a policy nut right now, it would allow the opposition, it would allow the Tories to deflect from what they're doing and say, how much would this cost? What about this? So perhaps the right thing to do, which is sort of what they're doing, which you might think politically is smart, is to just say, we're not you, you're horrible, look at you, and it's not working, it's all your fault. So I think the first thing in the sense in the manifesto is that you should be working away quietly and probably say it's all your fault and we'll, we'll come later with what's gone on and we have to seriously analyse things. So an example, yeah, you might want to change the remit of the Bank of England, but don't announce it in a speech in Bogner but you haven't thought it through and you haven't had a clue. These things need serious analysis. So they need to do serious analysis. So the idea of suddenly having a four day week, well, how would you implement it? What would you do? What would you get firms to say? I mean, it's just the practicality, maybe a smart thing to do, but the practicalities are kind of complicated. So I would argue that we should be trying to think about things that make people better off, try to think about ways of raising national well-being, and try to do them in a calm, considered way and it may well be that it shouldn't be in this manifesto. In this manifesto, you say, we're working really hard to find policies that will help the person in, in the Mile End Road and in Merthyr Tidville. But I want those things to be considered rather than it appears that economics should not be, as Liz Truss has done, economics by shooting from the lip. Economics is much more complicated than that in an uncertain world. And the last thing you should do is dumb things. So it's complicated, be careful, but and be considered. So I would certainly say that the concentration has to be try to improve the relative position of ordinary people and offer them something. And offer, think of the 50 Labour seats, think of Labour seats in, in, in Wales. What is it that you can offer that the person can step into? And it might be, you've talked about green things, it might well be it, coordinated with other parties who in the end would say, well, all right, we're in this together. We've got minor differences, but this is about maybe a coalition where the central focus and purpose is to raise the well-being of the ordinary person. That's not a crazy thing to say, right, Kerry? I mean, that's, that's hard to disagree with that. You know, you and I, you say I'm green. So you, you, in the end, you might say, OK, but the, the similarities between us are greater than the differences, and perhaps we can come together. And I think that might be a coalition of those interested in the well-being of ordinary people is probably where we need to go and after the disasters that we've seen you know and and we also want to have integrity and trust and we're not going to lie and we're not going to you know we're not going to party gate all these other things i think that's very much where i come from i think there's certain bodies in the in british welsh politics who are looking along those lines danny well it's it's you know it's it's the i mean in a sense i think about Economics is about compromise. It's about trying to do smart things. And ideology has got us into this situation. I mean, lines of people, line, lines for hours and hours long sitting at Dover, which 
people like me who've been anti-Brexit forever have warned what's going to happen. And I listened to interviews this morning, and apparently it's the French. It's the French's problem. But we always knew that. I mean, I knew that. We knew that. We knew that. I mean, to argue it's all because of the French, but last time you'd wave your passport, and this time they have to check, have you got a driver's license? Have you, how much, how, have you been in the, in the European Union for, in the last 100 days? Have you got a return ticket? Got any money? Well, that's going to take quite a long time, but that's what the Brexiteers chose. And that was always going to be a disaster on a, being inside a market, the single market where you were all, everything was free movement and everybody wanted to get in. And now you choose to get out and complain about the fact that, that, that they're keeping you out. Well, that was always what was coming. And so we have this Brexit issue and Labour Party is going to have to deal with it. Labour Party is going to keep saying I'm for Brexit. Well, OK. Those of us who, uh, who think Brexit is an unmitigated disaster continue to say, and I said it many times, you can see on Twitter, I said, you tell me as a professor of economics and a commentator and an ex-monetary policy person, tell me a single benefit in economic terms of Brexit, and nobody has yet given you one. There's not a single one that I can name. Not one. There are none. Lines at the border, reductions in output, rising prices. The UK is going to get higher prices because of Brexit, because, you know, that, that, that's, what it's, that's what it's generated. Oh, and the last I should go back to, remember that Patrick Minford actually said this, which is probably right. He said, the great thing about Brexit is it'll wipe out UK manufacturing and agriculture. So that's what he said. And that's probably where we're going. So I thought yes, he seemed to think that was a good thing. But the people of Wales in agriculture and manufacturing might think otherwise. Mm -hmm. I think otherwise. Yeah, I think we all think otherwise too, Danny. Yeah. Um it's interesting i think you're one of the people who's probably best placed to answer this question is what has been the international impact to britain as a consequence of brexit well I'm, i live in the united states and i was on a program with andrew neil with kate andrews and nadine sohairi and i was talking about brexit and i said that for the united states the idea that brexit would happen and it would threaten the irish peace accords was a complete non-start. There was never going to be any deal with the United States where, where, where the, there was a threat to the Irish peace accords. And I said, and Nancy Pelosi had made that absolutely clear. And Kay Andrews, I recall, said to me, we really don't care about the comments of some random American politician. Nancy Pelosi is the most powerful woman in the world. She's the Speaker of the uh, House of Representatives. And there will be no deal with the United States if Nancy Pelosi says there is no deal. So that seems like a pretty interesting starting point. You say Nancy Pelosi is irrelevant, but the, 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 the Biden government has made it absolutely clear there will be no deal. There is, if you're going to threaten the Irish peace accords, then you're, then you're in, in, in deep trouble. So I think the answer is that Brexit does not appear to be uh, something that people think is a pretty darn good idea. But in the United States, the very idea that the Irish peace accords might be um, threatened and that there would be a border between the North and the South of Ireland is a non-starter. So sitting from here, I would say the response to Brexit is you must be bloody joking. There is no chance, no chance. And Biden has made it clear there was no chance of a trade deal between the United States and the UK. Um, the Brexiteers have been successful in getting deals with, with various small islands and got a deal with New Zealand, which apparently in New Zealand just can't believe that they would, Britain would negotiate such a dumb deal. So I think the answer is that certainly from here, you must be joking is the response. And, and Britain has basically shot itself in the foot and, see, and, and basically seen itself in terminal decline. So I think, I mean, that's obviously my, my view. You can ask others, but... Um, certainly, you know, in a way, Brexit is back the wrong horse, which was Trump was supportive, but Trump's gone. There is no chance of a trade deal with the United States. I mean, the farmers here are terrified, Danny, about... Yeah, of course. Well, of well remember what Minford said. Deal. But Minford, they said that it's not all... Minford in the House of... Uh, in, a, in one of the Parliament Select Committees said it will wipe out agriculture. That's what you voted for. Why are you surprised? Wales voted for it, but it was going to wipe out Welsh agriculture. Why? So what's the logic? Well, it, the protection to Welsh agriculture through the common agricultural policy and the protections around meant that it was protected and Wales got the biggest subsidy, um, particularly for Welsh agriculture. Well, now what you do is you take the barriers away and you expose it to world prices. So world prices are lower. The price of sheep you can get from Peru or whatever wipes out Welsh sheep farming. Well, that's what you voted for. 
I mean, if you could say I didn't realize, but that's what you voted for. Voted to wipe out Welsh agriculture. Of course they're scared. Maybe they didn't realize it. But think about fishing. You voted to wipe out fishing. You voted to wipe out wheat. Well, of course you haven't in a sense because of the war in Ukraine and the price of wheat has risen. But in normal terms, that's what Brexit has done. It's exposed you to world markets where the prices are lower. And you were protected by the common agricultural policy. Once the Brexit went, then the subsidies that people would get and the subsidies to each Welsh household was gone. And that's what you voted for. You may not have known it. But I mean, and that after Brexit was voted, the biggest searches on Google Trends was what is the European Union? Because people didn't realize what they'd done. Now, maybe, I mean, in a way for an economist, it's hard to understand when people vote for things that are in their worst interests. And now you're paying the price. It's very Sorry. interesting. I, I think it's very interesting, though, isn't it, that the Conservatives and the, and the Labour Party are so silent on the damage it's doing. I can't recall a situation where the big two political parties have ever been in, in agreement about something that is so bad for the country they're meant to represent? Well, I think the answer is that public opinion has not moved perhaps as much as you think it would. The support for Brexit, I mean, it's not terrible. I mean, it's like 55, 45 or something. I mean, so the political parties, I mean, Starm is very worried about what's he going to do in places like those 50 seats that are supportive of Brexit. I think the reality is you sit and you wait and the consequences of Brexit become more apparent, and then the mood move, it, mood, music moves. I mean, things are going to get worse. I think we're going to see price rises for energy later in the year. We're seeing all this stuff at the border now. Um, it, and control's coming in. And, you know, the, the world is likely to get worse, but it's going to have to get worse before it gets better. Um, and, you know, you might imagine that the new prime minister is going to be in charge of a poison chalice. This is, this is not going to look good. You're going to argue for Brexit and that makes things worse, drives down the output, UK enters a recession. Who's to blame? I mean, Sunak can hardly argue this recession isn't because of him. And Truss is going to say, oh, I can blame the Labour Party. And you say, well, the Labour Party was last in office, you know, in 2010. You've been in office for 12 years. So the, you know, and the Welsh Nationals can say, not our fault. And so the blame game is about to come as unfortunately, people's living standards are going to go down and people are going to get very fearful. Consumer confidence is falling. People's fear that they're going to lose their jobs have risen. And that's the, the Tories are responsible. Remember, Gordon Brown got kicked out. The Great Recession came. Who did people blame? They blamed him for not repairing the roof. But that was always nonsense. That had nothing to do with Gordon Brown. It's a global financial crisis. In a way, that's what Starmer has to do. He has to make the blame fall on the the Tories, and then come in and say, eventually, OK, we're going to take over and we're going to try and fix this mess. So I don't think, Terry, that it's going to be in the manifesto. It should be working away quietly. You say, it's all your fault. Then you get elected. You say, well, OK, we've got these plans. This is what we're going to do, right? And we've coordinated with other parties. And, you know, it, we're going to have suddenly, let's say, we're going to have raised income tax threshold or, you know, I mean, remember all these people who don't pay taxes. What we'll do is we'll give subsidies to the ordinary people of some amount. We'll give them an energy, uh, we'll give them an energy uh, price boost and we'll pay everybody 5,000 quid. I mean, that's what happened in the United States. Everybody out of bank account got money put in. We'll just give people money. One of the interesting things you said, you mentioned earlier, and, and I want to go into a little bit more depth with you, is the, is the question of independence. Something is, that a lot of people see as a natural consequence of all the sort of political turmoil that Westminster, Brexit, what have you. A lot of people always make the argument that Scotland and Wales couldn't survive economically as independent countries. What is your assessment of that? Well, obviously, this is complicated. And uh, I'm at the University of Glasgow, where we're actually going to think very hard about independence from and take a completely neutral position. Um, uh, Muscatelli is the economist principal at, at Glasgow. He's going to be involved in the debate. And we're going to take a sort of neutral position. This is something you're going to have to think through very seriously. You know, what are you going to do about, for example, currency you're going to keep the you keep the pound you're going to have a scotty or a welshie or something um those are complicated questions are you going to have your own central bank what debt level is there going to be or are you going to have a seat at the at the, the the bank of england now obviously a transition is a big deal because there are debt obligations welsh pensioners welsh people have paid money in and they're entitled to pensions that come out of the central budget how are you going to deal with that you know, you're going to retire at some point you retire well the money's held in the treasury the, work, the people in Wales have to get it. The one thing I think that people would say is that small countries have actually done pretty well, especially small countries with their own currency. 
So Iceland, Sweden, um, Sweden continues to have its own kind of thing as Denmark does too. So the happiest countries in the world actually turn out to be Northern European countries. So Iceland, Denmark, the Netherlands, Finland, Sweden, Norway, um, small independent countries. So there's no reason why a small independent country can't survive and can't do well. The problem is there's a lot of thinking to be done about how you make that transition from being part of the UK to being a separate country. Now we have some devolution already, right? We do, because the Welsh government, Scottish government and so on. But there's, two, there's a lot of questions that have to be solved. So not least of which, let's say we think about in Scotland, should Scotland get its own currency? Should it get its own central bank? And if you've got a currency, should it track the pound? Could it track the, the uh, could it go into a currency union? Let's say with Iceland and Sweden, what would the benefits be of that? And what would happen to the currency on the day that you announced it? So I think the answer is that these things are all feasible, but it's a complicated move. And people just say, well, we can go independent. They haven't really thought it through. There are complicated things to think about, and Scotland is going to have to think about them. And people, in, uh, people are going to say the status quo is the best, and you can't, you can't move forward. But, but small countries have emerged. So think about what's happened since the fall of Russia, of the Russian economy. The Soviet Union, all these little countries have emerged, Slovakia, Slovenia, Croatia, Montenegro, um, Lithuania, Latvia, uh, Estonia. So these little countries have emerged. Some have, for example, have joined the euro, some have not. So I think we have a, a good history of it. But to say it's not possible is ridiculous because we have a history of these, of these countries that have emerged. But it's a lot of thought. And in principle, this this can happen. The fact that Wales doesn't grow bananas, Lithuania doesn't grow bananas either. So small countries can survive. You need to think this thing through. Uh, and in the end, you have to ask yourself, is it better being independent or not independent? And the answer to that is, it's unclear. So an example is, you know, should you join this, well, this currency? Well, the question is not so much, should you join it at what price do you join it? And, what, and how do you think these things through? You know, how are you going to deal with law things? I, I, I mean, if you were with it, I mean, Scotland, here's a lot of thing. The thing with Scotland, which is pretty interesting, is that their independence vote last time, in a sense, was a vote to leave the European Union. The vote this time might well be for a vote of independence, and then Scotland says, we'd like to rejoin the European Union. Wales might actually make that choice. Think of Northern Ireland. That's what Northern Ireland essentially would do. Northern Ireland essentially is still part of the European Union. So these are complicated questions, but I think they're all reasonable ones and ones that honest people can sit and think about. And for those to say, Wales has to be part of the United, no, it doesn't, but it has to set, make a set of choices and negotiate things and, and we'll see. And I would suspect that if you see this stronger move in Scotland towards independence, you will see that Wales will do the same. That, that's been great looking at uh, all these issues that we we face around the world and in the UK and in Wales uh, this evening. But one of the things we at Hero Ice Pod are trying to do is to not just have a political kind of mm -hmm. sharing of knowledge and experience, but it's also around um, how civic society works. And one of the things I don't think it's much of a looking at Wales is kind of the Bank of England and how that type of side of the economy works. It's very much seen as that end of the M4 in London. And you were um, a noted member of the Bank of England Monetary Policy Committee. Can you just quickly talk us through how that works in practice? Well, I, I was appointed by Gordon Brown. And part of the reason turns out that I knew Ed Balls. <laughs> Ed Balls was a journalist for the Financial Times in, in Boston. And he and I, he used to call me up all the time and ask me things. So I never applied. And they called me up, Gordon Brown called me up and said, Danny, I want you to join this committee. And I went, oh, okay. And he said, well, Ed Bull thinks it would be great. So off I go. So just to give you a sense of it, Mervyn King opposed me completely. From the moment I got there, they started briefing against me because I wasn't part of the known clique. What do I mean by the known clique? Well, every single person basically on that committee had, had was lived in London and had been to Oxbridge. And I used to sit in the meetings and I'd listen to this, listen to people saying to me, when I was in Cambridge or when I was in Oxford, and I used to say as response, when I was in Bogner, because just as relevant, right? So, there was, so the problem was that basically everybody on that committee um, essentially had lived in London and the Southeast 
and basically have the same background. They'd either have been a professor at LSE or they'd been a banker or they'd been a civil servant. And what did they know about the streets of Merthyr Tidville? Go back to Merthyr Tidville. What did they know about the streets of St. David's? What did they know about Aberystwyth? And the answer was nothing. And so what you got is groupthink, where the group didn't understand what was going on and represented somebody who'd done PP at Oxford, who lived in Westminster or lived in, you know, Mayfair. And so increasingly moves for independence. And I remember Alex Salmon, when I was on the NPC, Alex Salmon and I used to talk, and Alex Salmon was very struck with the fact that surely Scotland should have representation on that committee. And the answer, in a sense, and Liz Truss has argued that independence of the Bank of England is, is impact. Well, the answer is yes, because it doesn't appear to represent the interests of the Welsh or the Scottish. Um, it represents bankers, civil servants, and, and people who've been to Oxford. Um, and, the, and in a sense, the people who did best, I think, there were probably three or four people who did best on that committee, who were the most outspoken, that were different, and could and, and Mervyn King couldn't get a hold of. And, and those were Alan Posen, who came from the United States, an American, but very clearly had views of things and learned about the world. Willem Boiter, famous Willem Boiter, Dutchman, who actually voted once. There was, a, I think there was a vote for 20, somebody wanted to vote for 25% and somebody else wanted to vote for 50. And he said, it's all ridiculous, let's make it 37 and a half. And they wouldn't let him record 37 and a half and they made him say 40. And so he was an independent thinker. Susha Wadwani was another one. But and I, and I think me, I mean, I was very much, you know, against the grain. But if, in a sense, if groupthink is present and everybody does well, that's fine. But if you have groupthink and it's a disaster, and the Bank of England since 2008 has been a disaster, then there are arguments to, to change the remit. Groupthink will get it right. I find groupthink, they get it wrong, a disaster is a, a, a and the evidence actually is the group think is what causes organizations to fail. So there's certainly arguments to reconsider the remit of the Bank of England. I think it probably should be independent. Maybe it should have three members, maybe it should have four, maybe it should have a member appointed by Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. Let's say that a committee of four or five or something. That would not be nuts. But you have to think about the fact that this committee is a committee of nine people not elected by ordinary people. And, it, and does it represent the, the interests of the people of Wales? And the answer is no. And so time to change, folks. Time to change. And when you have the governor of the Bank of England saying things like, workers should make a, have wage cuts, even though I make 750000 a year. Well, out of touch, sunshine. Out of touch. That was not a smart thing to say. Uh, and so you need to have it representing the interests of the people of Wales. And the question is, could you find something better? Yeah. Could it have been better? Yeah. And did it help that... Everybody been at Oxbridge and lived in London and got it wrong. No. Danny, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much for coming on. Of course. Uh, uh, if people want to hear more from you, where can they go and find you on Twitter? Oh, at D underscore Blanchflower. And then um, you just type Blanchflower, you'll see my website and pictures of fishing and all my papers. And I'm on Bloomberg a lot. I'm a Bloomberg TV contributing editor. So I'm on, I'm on podcasts and TV and radio a lot. Um, and I... And I dissent a lot from from the group think. Fantastic. That's exactly what we want. Um, if you've enjoyed what you've heard this evening, please don't forget to find us on Twitter and Facebook at Heroith Pod or go to our website www.walespolitics.com. Thank you for listening to Heroith. If you like what you heard, please don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. <laughs>